There is a kink, gay, or queer, I should say queer, couple on YouTube, Amp and Mr. Christopher, and the Mr. Christopher half is doing an interview about being an adult worker for many years. He's 55. I'm very excited. The title of this video is 55-year-old gay ass. Quote, I do this as a community service. You know it's gonna be good. First of all, I just wanna say before we even begin, aesthetics, 10 out of 10. Look at these paddles. Look at these beautiful things behind us. I just love everything that I'm seeing. I'm asking you for your trust. You need to tell me what you want, and then I'm gonna do it to you. Ooh. And you're gonna like it. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> Wait, and and how, and, uh, sorry, I'm flustered. I'm flustered, I'm flustered. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Ooh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Love it. Hello there. I'm outside. Can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. What is this beautiful spot? <gasps> Oh my god, beautiful. Oh, that's gorgeous. Are there two of them? The neighbors were. Oh, no. Yeah, just me, just me. Yeah. Matt, nice to meet you. Good, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I think I already know you guys, but I'm, I'm. Okay, so that's Amp and that's Mr. Christopher. They're really nice. I've met them before. They're very nice people. And a Amp and I used to collab back in the day when I was a kink creator. Watching the content and stuff, and so I feel like I already know you, but nice to, nice to officially meet. Okay, first take with Daddy. You like to go by daddy, right? Yeah, you can call me daddy. I like, I'll be your daddy. I like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, spicy. I just love this aesthetic. I'm not going to play. Mm. Thank you for having me at this place. It's so gorgeous. And I'm glad you like it. I was so excited to talk with both of you and definitely interested in your past with your sex work and everything too, because I do a lot of episodes with sex workers and I love them all so much. So inspired by like the entrepreneurship of a sex worker and mm. the self-starterness of having to start their own business, figure out their prices, figure out how to screen people, like all of that really inspires me. Well, I kind of just fell into it. I didn't intend to. I started doing videos when I was 20 to pay for college because I was into it. I was into bondage. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for a company called Zeus. When I graduated college, though, uh, I toured Europe as a college graduation gift, and I met this guy who owned a sex store in Amsterdam, and he uh, just bought Drummer Magazine in San Francisco. Mm. And because cool. he knew my video work, he said, we're looking for a store manager in San Francisco. Would you be interested? Mr. Christopher agreed to the proposition and moved to San Francisco in 1992. Ooh, 1992. Then it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh, VHS tapes were selling in the 90s for like $80 a title. People were calling the store because they weren't even advertised right. It was just title price, title price. No pictures, no description. People were dropping $500 because there was no... There was no internet, there was nothing you could watch. So I just started tapping into that and so I started directing my own. Nice. And then I started my own distribution company for VHS tapes. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. My directing got better. Um, a big name company, Falcon, hired me uh, to direct their videos and I learned a lot. They were very big productions. Mm -hmm. We had $30,000 budgets per movie. Ooh, Unheard of. Girl. That's how much money was going into in the 90s. But now I feel like just like you do it yourself and that's what makes more money than actually like a studio. You know what's ironic is I made more money as an actor in 1992 than actors make today. I was making $600 to $1,000 and now you're lucky if you make 300. No, what? And obviously they're talking about adult movies. That's crazy. Whoa, I wonder because... I know when we went to San Francisco for Folsom and we went to, what is it, Mr. S. Leather? What's it called, guys? And they um, they were all there and we were all hanging out. There was like videotapes and a lot of their videos and stuff. And it is interesting to think about traditional adult content creation versus like an only, only, for only, uh, <laughs> OF is now like a censored word on YouTube, apparently. So I've, anyways, like the stream, guys. So that's interesting to think about the differences between the two and then what are the chances of making money. And, it, you know, you, you want to say, no offense, but like 
one reason to stay in shape is like if you're going to be an adult content creator, there's a lot of benefits to staying aesthetically in more shape than less shape, especially in like a gay community. So I think that's an interesting element as well because Mr. Christopher looks really good. Like he just looks really good, you know, and he's 55. He looking good. $300. That's the less than you can make it like a surf. Ooh, shout out. JJ says my partner has leather from him. Let's go. Serving shift at a restaurant. Exactly. <laughs> so. well, why would someone be enticed to get into adult films now with that kind of price? Well, what is different now? I, I, mm, it's always interesting when people say that the only reason to get into adult film is for the price, which is very interesting to me. I'm not sure that I relate to it, obviously, as somebody who's also posted content like for free. I will say it's, it's, for a lot of us, it's not just about the money, right? But also I can see why people wouldn't do it unless you were getting paid. But also, again, I think about it as, can you do your art craft and replace it with the minimum wage job you would be working anyways, or the teacher salary you'd be getting anyways? Then it's always worth it. But I think people think alternative content, including YouTube content creation is only good enough if it makes you a lot of money, which is interesting. <gasps> Ren, thank you. Gifted one membership. And Caitlin is the lucky member who got it. Let's go, girls. Posting a YouTube membership video tomorrow. You guys are going to enjoy uh, Tangent for YouTube memberships. I'm going to rant in this one. Okay. It's basically all of the stuff I had, I could have said in my Greg Deset video, but like didn't have a place for it. And then I also go on a Tangent. It's really good, actually. Sorry, not to brag, but I'm going to give YouTube members quite a video this month. Just like talking about ideas uh, surrounding sort of meeting people where they are in their journey and what that actually entails and means. And if there's an objective truth to sort of what path you can end up choosing after all. So if you're interested, become a YouTube member. Check it out. Thank you. Yeah, you'll see that studio has gone away because no one's buying that anymore has always evolved and shifted. So from VHS, it went to DVD, then it went to the internet, and now it is in the fan site. So now the model is in control of their own image for the first time, and they have a production uh, equipment in their pocket. Yeah. We didn't used to have that. We used to have like huge cameras and lights and stuff, and now this has made it very accessible for people to do on their own. How do you feel about that coming from the studio sets and the big lights and the big cameras that now it's kind of completely done a 180. I like it. I mean, I didn't I didn't expect to at 55 to still be doing oh. in front of the camera uh for one. Mm. Uh but I like that I own all my own shit that I produce. Nice. Um I have complete control over my image. Uh and then my history of knowing how to light and shoot really just helps me. Mm. So I think people coming up, they need to learn some of the basics to make their the quality of their footage better. Nice. Uh, and then that'll make them stand out. True. So this is your place, right? Yes, this is my place. And it doesn't normally like, look like this. We just pulled the couch from over there, over here, because we thought it, you wouldn't want to shoot into the window because the light will suck. They're so considerate. They're like so considerate about um, like where he might be want to shoot, like maybe where he wants to shoot, which is so lovely. What a, like, <laughs> that's so thoughtful. Love you're already thinking like, I love filming with content creators because you already get it. You already understand the vibe. Does that look good? Uh, Mr. Christopher and his partner Amp are hugely popular YouTubers as well. I look good. Do you look good? I have decided that I look great. I could wish for nothing else. Amp's channel and Mr. Christopher, I don't know if they, I think they have two separate channels, but they have like maybe a dual channel. It's what's the safe word, what's like W-A-T-T-S, the safe word. So super cute, right? We love it. Also, Kimberly, welcome to memberships. Thank you so much. So you guys don't live together? No, he, uh, Amp lives two blocks down. So. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's yeah. not too bad. It was great during COVID. Because you had two spots? We had our own spots. Oh, yeah. Because mm. <laughs> both of our spaces are different studios. So I've got my streaming and he does his own sex worky stuff here. So it's, it's nice to have our spaces there. How long have you guys been together for now? Nine years. Nine years? Woo! Wow. I know too long. No, that's goals. <laughs> Honestly, like that's what I feel like most of us are looking for. Nine years, like in the nine years. That's a long time, bros. Gay world. That's so many years. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> We're very old. Thank you. No, yeah. How, how old? Because you, you look. How old are you? You're you're young. 
I mean, you're both young, but you are definitely... 21. No, 34. Because you're my age. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. He's younger yeah, than so me. nine years. <laughs> Amp is younger than me. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Good for you guys. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, my dad thought I was having a midlife crisis. Did he? Yeah, for sure. Why? Because you're dating someone younger or what? 24, yeah. <laughs> oh, and how, and how... That's, that's a huge age gap. That's a huge... That's not... You know how I am about age gaps. I'm not the biggest fan. I'm not the biggest fan. I don't really love it. Um, but I'm glad it's working out. But yeah, I don't I don't really love the age gaps. But you know, your life, your wins, someone's gonna be the exception to the age gap, you know? How, <laughs> but you're you're young too. How old are you? I'm fifty five. I'm not that young. <laughs> you you look great. Thank you. And you're hot. So what, like forty five and twenty four, forty whatever it was. So mid forties and mid twenties together. That's an age gap. That's an age gap, bros. So it doesn't even matter. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. You're forgiven. As I came here, I was walking around the Castro district and just really soaking it in. <laughs> Bisa says, respectfully, that is crazy. Respectfully, that is crazy. Also, congratulations to nine years. It's a big deal. And I thought about, you know, our history here and, you know, the AIDS epidemic here and you coming here in 1992. What, mm -hmm. what was that like for you? Pretty much it was at the height of the AIDS epidemic. Oh, cry, tear. Oh, depressing. We'd love to, we'd love to see living history, though. Mamie says, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think they're very specific case, the age gap works? I think in any specific case, something works. Like I've said before, I mind an age gap relationship because I think you're rarely the exception, but sometimes you are, right? So I wouldn't encourage an age gap relationship. I would, unless the person is over 30, then at that point I don't give. But if the person is in their 20s or younger, it's like, give them a second to figure out their life, please. But also someone is going to be the exception. I'm sure that they are considerably, obviously the exception, right? There's always going to be the exception. And look, maybe I'm just speaking from my bubble where, and just statistics, like you're, most likely not the exception. And so how do you figure out that you're, you're the exception to the rule? And it's going to be the health to un, or dysfunction relationship you're having. So Amp and Mr. Christopher have always been a relatively very healthy couple. I've never heard anything about them. I've never seen anything in their videos that's a red flag. I feel like realistically, that's what we're looking for. So even in traditional heterosexual relationships, the age gap relationships are always red flags. That's why they have the reputation of being toxic because they were incredibly inappropriate, right? Like, obviously, I just saw another one about a guy with six wives and 29 kids. I was thinking about watching it with you guys. And he was 34 dating a 14 year old and getting her pregnant. So obviously there's like a large gap and, you know, there's just like a conversation to be having about those large gap relationships. And when they're starting, a 14 year old is very different than a 24 year old. And at the same time, a 24 year old is very different than a 45 year old. So, okay. There's like all of these things that come into it. Obviously some people will be the exception and guys, some people being the exception means millions of people will be the exception. And the question is, are you one of those people? Right. And so like for me, no, every time I dated older, it was so clear to me that the person that was older into the younger person was just very immature, very incapable of dating people their own age, and they were heavily toxic, and they were looking for a very specific dynamic that they couldn't figure out how to do healthy. And then when I see it around me, that's often the case where like they just can't manage. They are usually co or trauma bonding, like codependent. So a lot of the age gap relationships I see are that way. Now, again, there are exceptions. There are always going to be exceptions. So I'm here for the exceptions, you know? Right. It was a lot of fear at that time, uh, but it was also a lot of, we have nothing to lose. We thought we were going to die. I came here. Okay, hold on. I really want to hear this. But also, I would just like to say adult work is similar, where you're going to be the exception if you have a really good time with it. Uh, most of the time, it's a very difficult industry to sort of maintain. It's a very difficult industry to find a positive relationship and that's why you have to work so hard at it because a lot of people who end up going into adult work are survival they're in survival situations which is a very different situation right and survival situations guys are not the same thing as somebody who's surviving to get mcdonald's survival s work is not the same thing as survival mcdonald's work like they're both a job but the ratio to danger those are very different like to me, survival S work is not, I need money, I'm gonna get a job because then it would be just a job. 
it means there's an element of safety that is a higher risk and outrageously higher risk compared to like a quote normal job. And people who are usually in that situation, I think are in that situation for very like toxic reasons, right? It's not like healthy people choose survival S work, right? Healthy people choose a job that makes sense for them. That's within reason. It is not within reason to have any job that's like high risk unless it makes total sense to you. So again, there's like so many things uh, that play that play into this. The context is so specific. So I would say that you would be the exception and even S work to have like a really exceptional time with it, but that's growing as well. And as time goes on, I think the future is bright for S work. I think the future is bright for positive relationships with S work and for families accepting it and for society moving on and treating it as just kind of a option as a job without any of the stigma, because really a lot of these jobs outside of survival have the stigma that deal with it. Because look, even if you work minimum wage, there's somebody that's like, you're not good enough to date. You're not a good enough person. Oh, you're a manager at McDonald's. Gross. And that's, what is that? That's a stigma. Why would you, why would you care if a person is a manager at McDonald's? Like, are they making money? Are they making the same amount of money that like a teacher would get? It's just teacher has sort of like a, it's looked upon as something like better in society. All those things are stigmas. So, you know, all of that's going to play a role. Anyways, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Here, like a lot of kids are now coming here. Uh, I came to get away from a religious home. San Francisco was a gay bubble. It still is. Um, so there was a <laughs> lot of resources here. But yes, during the AIDS crisis, a lot of people um, came here because they thought they weren't going to make it. That's also mm. where we had a lot of like ACT UP and other uh, organizations that came here and fought for a lot of the civil rights that we have right now uh, because the administration was just ignoring us. And ignoring AIDS. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration largely ignored the AIDS epidemic, which was rapidly spreading and devastating our community. Officials often dismissed the crisis due to the stigma surrounding the disease. This lack of response not only hindered scientific advancements, but also perpetrated fear and misinformation. A mystery disease known as the gay plague has become an epidemic unprecedented in the history of American medicine. There was a tremendous amount of homophobia. No one came to our defense except our own community. Just because my friends and I are gay, if we are affected by this disease, that no one really cares, that it seems that we deserved it, so let us die. The administration's inaction contributed to a prolonged public health disaster, leaving countless individuals without the necessary support and care. This audio you're about to hear is from a White House briefing in 1982, when journalist Reverend Lester Consolving asked the deputy the first public question about the AIDS epidemic. unbelievable Damn. circumstance of a community. Damn, the way he like made a joke, he laughed. You know, do you have it? Is that why you know about it? I don't know about it. Do you only know about it because you have it? Damn. Community that in addition to being hated and under attack is now forced alone to try to figure out how to deal with this extraordinary medical disaster. And that's also where like poor actually kind of stepped up and did its job and like started putting condoms. Falcon was the first one to put condoms on to promote safe sex and make it sexy and hot. It was really the advent of PrEP that the condoms came off again. And that was really hard for a lot of people because we had trained them that the only safe sex there was was with the condom. And now your generation has had PrEP for six, eight years, mm -hmm. and now they don't even remember what it was like before a condom. I love talking to people that, you know, are a bit older than me because it's because of you guys and the fight that you have gone through that we are able to live the way we live. And I think so many people in my generations and people younger than us take it for granted and don't really... It's easy to rem it's easy to forget how recent this history is. And I think that's kind of key. I think there's like an illusion we have that this happened a very long time ago. 
and it did in some ways, like 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, sounds like a long time ago. But if our parents are still alive and remember it, was it really that long ago? And I think that's what's really important here. Bryson says, damn, people being shamed away from being compassionate. And that's compassion means to suffer with that if you can't suffer with the person, it's really hard to be compassionate. Look, it's very hard for us to be compassionate. Tell me, how easy is it to be compassionate to Sneeko while he's ranting and raving and saying he would unfriend somebody like Sketch if they were his friend? It's hard to be compassionate to everybody, especially if you don't understand them. And most people don't make an effort to understand LGBTQA people yet. And we're working on it. We're definitely getting better. But yeah, there, that's why I think I tried to give credit where credit is due because I think it's incredibly amazing to see people change their mind over years and to see people get closer to, I think, what I think is a better, a better relationship with people, which is to be open and compassionate. Even if you can't get around to quite understanding like gay people, I think getting to the point where you remember that there are people just like you is like, I will take it. Like, it's not perfect, but God, nothing is. And it's better than this. It's better than the White House, like, laughing at the gay, you know, the AIDS epidemic and gay people in the gay communities. I mean, at least, at least now we have presidents who can openly support gay marriage. Because remember Barack Obama, whether in private or public, he agreed with gay marriage for his first, you know, run as president, he had to be anti-gay marriage. I think privately he was probably always pro-gay marriage, but just for the for the vote, you know? So the fact that he could come out in 2012 with Joe Biden and be pro-LGBT, like that's beautiful, you know? What a time. Choose to learn about our history or choose to, you know, commend those that came before us. I agree with that, but it's also, um, there's not a lot of people teaching that history either. That's not taught in school. Um, so it's not only your For generation's of, fault. Yeah. Um, right. And so and right now, right now, your rights are all of our rights are on the chopping block and we don't realize it. We have we fought for these rights that you now have, like gay marriage that can go away still. Um, that did you just see what happened to abortion that could be swept away? And I mean, they're already talking about interracial marriage being a state's issue. And I'm like, what? What are you guys doing? Like, they're literally talking about that in the news. And I'm like, what is going on, bro? I think a lot of gay youth is living kind of with blinders on, thinking, oh, they'll never take that away from us. That's my right. Um, but those rights were fought for. And with a lot of blood, uh, they were fought for. So chills hearing that. Yeah. I was just at Manchester Pride last year and I was really moved because they had a candlelight vigil at the end to remember people who had passed. And I realized I haven't been to a candlelight vigil in eight years. That used to be an occurrence that happened every month candlelight vigils here in San Francisco. I really teared up because I thought about people I hadn't thought about in years and I really felt guilty about that uh, because a lot of our people died. And a lot of amazing people died. Back in that time, was there a survivor's guilt? <sighs> I don't know if I would call it guilt. Some people were more overly cautious than others. And everyone had their, just kind of like, if you look at COVID, people had different coping mechanisms for it. Some people wore masks all the time. Some would just do it. They would take their masks off on the street, right? So you would have what you would consider safe for you guidelines. I came out in 90, so I knew that penetrative sex probably would transmit, uh, transmit HIV to me. So most of the sex I got into was bondage and jacking off. I didn't really do anal until I reached mid thirties, wow. truthfully, because I was scared. So everyone had their wow. ways of coping and surviving. Was that part of the reason why you got into the bondage world? I mean, I was truly into bondage. I, I would off to Wild Wild West when I was a kid. Anytime he got captured, I don't even know if you know what Wild Wild West is. No, but I love it. I can imagine what it is, and I love it. I love it. James Conrad was super hot, and he'd always get captured, and they tear his shirt off, and, <laughs> and I love that. I don't know if that was the main reason, but it was something. I love this. This is so lovely. This is a great interview. It's so it's so good because it's so true. Like all of this is so gut-wrenching and real and important and then on top of that it's also like there's still a lot of joy to be found a lot of good memories a lot of you know and tragedy 
there's humor and in humor there's tragedy tragedy and i just think this is a really great balance this is a great interview matt killed it this is great something i definitely leaned into because i totally got off on getting tied up this room can change to anything mm -hmm. so usually the couch is over there the coffee table turns into a spank bench. Oh, um, fine. And so I do pro dom work out of here as well. Mm -hmm. So, Great. and then over here, your basic puppy cage. <gasps> this chair is. Oh my gosh. Here. I haven't even turned around yet to see this. And then this is. Ugh. Ugh. I'm so, I want this bed so bad. I want a bed with a cage underneath and bars for hard points on the top. I want a BDSM ba bed so badly, but they're so expensive. And once I buy one, I'm not moving because they're a pain to move. The bedroom, Ugh. which I would have made my bed had I known you were gonna come. No, I love it. It's all part of the vibe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and then this is- the This is like BDSM hoarders. <laughs> the only kind of acceptable hoarding is BDSM hoarding. <gasps> That needs to be cleaned up. Oh There's my gosh. There's a lot of toys and stuff going on. How long have you been collecting all this for? I've been doing it for 30 years, so a little bit. And these are expensive too, aren't they? Like all the leather and stuff? Expensive, yeah. Wow. Do you have a favorite one? Um, or one that you use the most often? That's like saying, which is your favorite baby? <laughs> uh, like I love this chassis cage, they don't make this anymore. <gasps> that looks like antique. This is 30 years old, it has a jock cut built in. Wow. Um, yeah, there's just, Gosh. there's a lot. I love the whole BDSM <sighs> world. I love that we're, you know, in front of this. What I love a lot about the BDSM world is that it can be fun and exciting, but it's all very consensual. Yes, and there's like contracts that people talk about, you know, or or words or safe words. And it's a very safe space, but a place where you can still have fun. So most people think of BDSM as like a really harsh, scary place. Yeah. But if you really think about it, it's really the most trust you can have. Mm -hmm in the other person. You are trusting someone to be your most vulnerable, like literally tied down. Mm -hmm. So what does that? Which is why it's a great place for learning boundaries and a good place for predators to hang out. I do think there were less predators in BDSM when I was, you know, active in the scene than in vanilla scenes. I think predatory behavior is much more typical and expected in vanilla circles than in BDSM circles. So I felt much safer in BDSM circles personally. But I will say some of the people, there were a couple of predators who ended up at the dungeons, which really sucked. But the dungeons were very swift, banned people, reported people. They were really good at that. I feel like vanilla circles they're less likely to report predators than BDSM circles. So I always felt much safer there, you know. Uh, discourses have been so uh, far away from it since COVID. Damn, I miss the community. Yeah. Yeah, like it's, it's it. this really makes me like, even me, you know, you start to feel like, oh my God, I miss this. Like I miss this bubble. It's a great bubble, you know. It really is such a vibe and it's so different everywhere. The King community is just so diverse um, and I do miss that. I do miss it. Like I do miss the community, you know, but in every, again, every, I've been to so many different dungeons and different places in different States. Everyone is different. Different countries have different rules. Um, but I, you know, yeah, I just, I love the, you know, yeah. Explicit consent. Pris says vanilla doesn't have explicit consent. Could see how there would be more predatory behaviors. And it's hard to introduce it. Even when I go to vanilla communities, I just try to figure out what the consent rules are for the bubble because consent is a construct. So the issue is like, I just prefer BDSM's construct of consent, but I usually just adhere to whatever the bubble has and then I decide how to interact with it. But yeah, like consent is a construct. So we really got to pay attention, but think about how cool that is. That means you can make it whatever you want. You can have a conversation. But I think that vulnerability is so key. I think that's why I loved BDSM is that it allowed me to feel as vulnerable as I could get in situations, but I knew there was like a safety element to it that just felt so good, you know? Pris says, I would like to ask, is it possible to be a predator based off of ignorance or is it only intentional? Um, yeah, you can, I think you could only be a predator if you are a predator. Like, you, I don't think you can accidentally be a predator. I think people who make mistakes and cause harm, those are accidents. I think people that set out to cause harm are predators. 
So I think that like intention is everything and I don't understand how people don't understand that. Like intention is literally the difference between everything. It's why the courts take it into consideration. It's why mental health professionals take it into consideration. It's the difference between a person. It's just, it's so important. It's like everything. Intention is just everything, you know? And so I just, I don't understand how people don't consider the intention of, of people, which is why that, that's why it's so hard to judge a person. Are you doing this because you're ignorant? But then ignorance is bliss because you can do things and then feign ignorance. But staying ignorant on purpose so you don't have to be responsible is intentional. So your ignorance at that point doesn't matter because you're purposely staying ignorant so you don't have to be held accountable. That is intentional. And that's the difference between someone who's truly ignorant. They just literally didn't know. Now, of course, it's natural to get defensive when people call you out because usually when people call you out, they're being rude about it. They're being like unnecessarily rude. But I think what's really important is having a space where you can get, you know, be held to an accountability in relation to your values. So like, oh, I didn't mean to do this. I'm so sad I did this. I'm so sorry. How do I make it better? And then have a reasonable course of action to make it better. That do when you trust someone that much. It's a bonding ex experience for you. And there's just because it's erotic, there are so many socially acceptable forms of BDSM in society. And I, I learned this once when I went to a, uh, a foot massage place and it was in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, they put us in this dark room in these big lounge chairs and I had never done this. I don't like people giving me massages. So I'd never done this before, got in this massage chair and the first thing they put was a hot, wet towel over my face. And I was like, huh, that's sensory deprivation. That's like putting a blindfold on someone. Mm -hmm. And is a room full of old women getting this done to them, right? They took my shoes and socks off, so they're undressing me. And the next thing I feel is my feet going in scalding hot water. And I was not prepared for that. <laughs> but my whole senses went, whoa, I totally woke up, right? Mm -hmm. That's BDSM. And then all of a sudden I felt rubber mallets hitting my legs up and down, up and down, up and down. Up you know, down. everything is so contextual. Everything you do at a massage parlor, we do at a dungeon. Everything you do at church, we kind of do at a dungeon. <laughs> like, but the context changes the vibe, which is why there's so much nuance to be had about what is appropriate for which group of people. When is it appropriate? And that's why I say like BDSM isn't inherently sexual. Because everything you do at a massage parlor, you can do at a BDSM dungeon. And the question is, is getting your nails done or a massage done, is that inappropriate or sexual? No. You could make it sexual. There's an episode of Sex in the City where Charlotte is trying on shoes for a guy until he finishes. He turned turning like he turned putting on shoes into a sexual action. But putting on shoes is not a sexual action. And that's the nuance that BDSM taught me over the years is just because you can make it sexual doesn't mean you have to. Orgasming isn't always everyone's goal. Sometimes there's something better. No, that's in back play. Mm -hmm. But this is just socially acceptable forms of it. Wow. But people pay for that. Mm -hmm. So this is my um, suspension rack. So this door frame. So like if I wanted to hang this. I'm going to be totally honest with you. Dusting this place seems impossible. I feel like there's no way to keep the dust out of this home, which is the problem with eclectic like homes, because as cool as they look, I just can't help but think about the dust. I mean, you all know I don't have very many things in this house. I keep it bare and like keeping the dust out of this house is a full time job. Oh, fun. That looks comfy, too. It's actually the, probably the most comfortable swing you'll ever be in. <gasps> Look at you go. Right. Oh, my gosh. I love it. <laughs> Can I try it? Yeah. Will you hold the camera? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, hold on to the top. Like this, right? Don't want you killing yourself. And just jump on, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, oh. now give me one love leg. Love it. Okay. Scoot your butt down, all the way down. Okay. Come on, you've done this before. Now, one leg up. Should we take my shoes off or is it no, not? No, it's fine. Okay. There you go. Yes. Oh, no. I could like honestly sleep like this. I know. Nice, Actually, nice. the puppy likes to play video games in it. This is his video gaming chair. The puppy, I love that. Yeah, there you go. <gasps> wow. Wow. This is the life. This yeah. Is the life. For your escort work, we're, we're allowed to talk about this, right? Yeah, you can talk about this. Okay. For your escort work, you 
this is prim- like what you're known for, right? Yeah. So I've been doing this for quite a while. So uh, I, I have a Rentman account where people can hire me as a pro dom. And so usually the first question I ask is, what kind of scene are you looking for? Mm. Um, if it's just like a fucking suck, that's really not. Well, okay. Hold on. First of all, we love, <laughs> we love that. Bryson, wait, Bryson says, my friends love shouting non-sexual BDSM randomly ever since I told them about you. Stop, I'm dying. Non-sexual BDSM. I know people think I'm capping. The cap is in town, but it's true, girls. There's a whole world out here where it's not always sexual, but it doesn't matter if it is. That's still great. You know, I think people have forgotten, like, intimacy isn't just an orgasm. It especially isn't just an orgasm. And I remember every day that BDSM taught me that. Not my religious upbringing, not sex education, not, not you know, cosmopolitan. BDSM taught me that intimacy, true intimacy is the key. And it has little to nothing to do with an orgasm. Not my bag. So, but if you want to experience bondage for the first time, if you want to be tied down, if you want to be... Sp- if you want a flogging, if you want sensory deprivation, if you want to do electro, I'm your guy. Mm-hmm. I know how to do that in a safe, sane way that won't go past your limits because I'm good at reading body language. Mm-hmm. What I'm wondering about the BDSM quote world is because there's so much communication that needs to happen before the actual BDSM mm-hmm. session. How are you finding the boundaries with your clients when they're you know sending you message after message after message before any money has been sent to you sure and that's where i go what kind of scene are you looking for and then they will tell me kind of a guideline once they're here strip them down on the knees and then we discuss what are you looking for what can i oh interesting no judgment just sharing we wouldn't the way that i was because i was mentored into bdsm by a leather woman in her 50s she's in her 60s now but she and she's from the San Diego scene to be fair and I think he's from the San Francisco scene so she would say that before you start negotiating now this is I think he's talking about his professional escort work which is different than BDSM work so let's separate the two right escorting work that's pro doming is different than BDSM as a lifestyle though they overlap obviously so maybe there's different rules because he's working with a client or maybe there's not. But like the way that I was taught and the way that I prefer it is that you don't put them in any compromising situation before negotiation. You make it completely neutral because people who are anxiety prone or have a lot of excitement going on, they might consent to things that they don't mean to because they're in the mood. And so when I do my BDSM negotiations for what they want and as a play partner, not I've never pro domed. I've never been an escort. I've never done BDSM as like an SW. I've only ever done BDSM as a lifestyle. But if I had a play partner, we would meet in a very neutral setting, sober, you know, maybe a restaurant, maybe like our home, but like we're hanging out, something very neutral. So that way when we're having the negotiation, it doesn't feel like there's pressure from you. And like, I remember one time I was going for a negotiation with a dom or a top because he wasn't going to be my dom, but he was going to top me. And we had gone for drinks and I had gotten drunk off of one beer. And so we just didn't negotiate that night because I had gotten drunk and I can't negotiate drunk. So, you know, we tried to go for a neutral setting, but I drank and I can't hold my alcohol because I'm a lightweight. So I think Mr. Christopher is talking specifically about pro doming, which I don't know much about. So maybe there's a difference there where you get to negotiate while the person is vulnerable, but stripping them down and having them be on their knees, that's a pretty vulnerable situation to negotiate from. If there's any pro doms in the chat, maybe you could speak to it. But I'm assuming that's a little bit of the difference. All right. Just talking about different bubbles within the same bubble, but also, okay. I do to you. That's hot. Yeah. This, are you strip them down on the knees and then we discuss what are you looking for? What can I do to you? That's hot. Yeah. This is when they'll be their most candid and open. Uh, Texting is really hard for people, especially if it's not face to face. But if you're looking someone in the eyes and you're going, I'm asking you for your trust. You need to tell me what you want. And then I'm going to do it to you. And you're going to like it. Oh, my gosh. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Maiden says, escort BDSM is iffy as someone who does it because the escort doesn't necessarily have any training whatsoever. It can be risky. Many of my clients don't want safe words. It's iffy. I can see that too. I can see a lot of clients being uh, iffy on safety, which is very frustrating, you know. 
Like, and and how? And uh, sorry, I'm flustered. I'm flustered. I'm flustered. <laughs> Let's turn this camera off. That'll be two fifty, please. Yeah, yeah, right, right. How how did you get involved in the BDSM world? Because it can be, if you're untrained, it can be very dangerous. You know what I mean? So how do you mm-hmm. make sure that you know what you're doing, that it's safe? Okay, so. I've taken many classes on shibari, rope nice. work, and that kind of stuff. Pressure nice. points. You know, for the most part, uh, what is unsafe mm-hmm. uh, in binding and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, every body is different, and everyone has different f- physical limitations. You need to ask those things up front mm-hmm. and in person. Um, but a lot of it comes from just experience and trial and error. There's two True. different sets of... BDSM. Uh, there's um, RAC, which is risk aware consensual kink, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which means there's a little risk involved in what you're doing. I know what those risks are and I'm okay with it. And, and that's part of the reason why it's kind of hot. Yeah. And the other one is SSC, safe, sane, and consensual kink. Um, and that is where you negotiate everything up front. Which one do you prefer out of those two? I like RAC. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So that's the difference. Okay, okay, okay. So I like a little bit of both. I think I like a combination, you know? I like a little bit of both myself, but okay. Because sometimes I can negotiate in middle of scenes, and then sometimes I'd like to pre-negotiate everything before we do it. But I've noticed that in the past, and this is many years ago, I had some play partners who, if we negotiated something ahead of time, so safe saying consensual, that we wouldn't change it once we got into the scene. But then I had some play partners that were more racked, so they were okay with changing it mid-scene. They were okay with doing something different. You know what I mean? I like a little bit of both myself. You know, I'm a little bit of a, uh, I like it all type thing. But Mimi says, this is so outside my bubble. It's so interesting seeing people speaking so openly about intimacy slash sexuality. I have a question. How do you go about separating sexuality and intimacy with strangers? Well, I think first and foremost, I don't think there needs to be a separation of them. I think the question is, is how do you have non-sexual BDSM? And I think that's with the right form of intimacy. You know, I think we practice it every day. We have intimacy with our neighbors, our friends, our children, our coworkers, and we never question ourselves about it. But the moment you do something that we assume always ties in sexuality or sexual activity, then we can't, under- we, don't, we, don't know, we don't know how to separate it. But I think the thing, the thing that is cool about BDSM is it kind of teaches you, depending on the bubble of BDSM, how to see BDSM like you would a coworker or like you would a family member in a sense, like in that, in that sort of intimacy without sexual sense. And I think that that is a beautiful thing to see and to feel. And I had to learn to do it. Guys, when I first entered BDSM, I didn't know how to separate the sexuality and the BDSM. Fun fact. I don't know if you guys know this about me. When I first joined the scene, even though I was trained to do it that way, my brain didn't get it. I had to do scene after scene after scene for me to finally understand how to separate my sexual brain from my like spiritual kind of platonic BDSM brain. The intimacy is there, but there's no sexuality. There's no orgasm. There's no play. There's nothing like that happening. There's no kissing. And I had to learn to separate it. And that was something that I learned by trying by doing it because I also went into BDSM with brain. I also went into BDSM with, you know, thinking about sexuality and thinking about sex and thinking about all these things. I was a virgin at my very first dungeon party for those of you who are new to my audience. It's the first time I'd seen a man naked in public in real life. And then I learned over the years, it took about three years of on again, off again, community participation for me to kind of break away from the assuming BDSM and sex kind of had to go together no matter what, even though I'd been practicing it. And even though I knew it, even though I, I verbalized it, um, I was dating this girl and she was my top and we had a nice, you know, one of, it was my first adult relationship, um, like real relationship. And it was great. And we had a lot of fun, but I definitely struggled in separating the sex from the BDSM. So every time she would top me, I would just like, I'd be all over her, girl. I would be like, okay, we, we got to do it. Like, we got, you know what I mean? It's just, anyways. So eventually, she was the beginning steps of me practicing after my mentor. So my mentor and I never played together. 
She simply mentored me, taught me how to do consent sheets, had me read books and took me to events. My first real experience with play partners was my girlfriend. And then after my girlfriend was other partners I had met after I moved to Seattle. And it was great. Like it was such an experience. Um, It's like really nice thinking about it now because that was so long ago. I'm 35 and I was like 21, 22 when I was getting into this, like, this was a very long time ago, you know? Um, but I, I really liked my time in the scene when I was really active. Um, it was really great. I really, I really recommend the scene, you know, if, if, but keep in mind it's people and people are flawed. So like, it's, you know, there will be bad and good always. Cause people are, you know, a mess, but anyways, I like pushing boundaries just a little bit mm -hmm. and being able to see when someone wants to be pushed and when they're not able to be pushed. Is there always a safe word involved? Yeah, safe words are very important and they're not always used. That's part of the play too, right? Yeah. If you're really good, then you won't have to use one. Is there a safe word and there's a safe word? Do you know what I mean? There's a safe word where I it's mean, like... The safe, way, the safe word should be the last thing, so you shouldn't need two. <laughs> you don't need a backup safe word. <laughs> Is there like a like, fake... Really Okay, but in my 20s, I had a backup safe word. I had this problem. I had a problem. In my 20s, I had a literal problem where I'd be like, red. And they're like, red? And I'm like, no, hard red. Like, I don't know what was wrong with my brain at the time. But I would red, but I didn't mean red. And I'm like, fuck. And so only for me, I would negotiate with my partners that I needed a backup safe word called hard red. So I would be like, red. No, hard red. Cause I had a hard time with yellow and now I use yellow in my own relationships. Like just talking, I'm like yellow. I'm too tired to have this conversation. Can we have it in 20 minutes after I eat? Like I use yellow so often now in my thirties, but for some reason in my twenties, I couldn't get yellow. Cause yellow, yellow doesn't mean stop. It means slow down. We need to renegotiate something or, you know, yellow is just such a great, like, but I just couldn't get it. So I did have a backup red safe word, which is so funny now in hindsight, because obviously I don't do that now. But when I was starting off, I definitely needed one. Really stop. <laughs> is that, yeah, is that like a fake safe word where it's like, oh no, stop. Oh, so, <laughs> so I see what you're saying. So you're thinking of CNC, which is mm. consensual non-consent. You want to be like, don't stop. Don't yeah. stop. Okay. Oh, don't stop. <laughs> so, yes, uh, that has to be negotiated up front. Do you have a lot of clients that are coming and this is their first time into this world and this is that's why they're hiring you? Absolutely. Uh, because a lot of people are really scared to do this with their partners, too. And a lot of partners don't want to do it with you. Uh, a lot of partners have a hard time hurting someone they love, right? Even if their partner wants to be hurt. And also, I would feel like a lot of people maybe are scared to admit to their partners that this is something they're into. And so mm -hmm. they can come to you. There's and a little shame involved when you, you, you different fetishes and kink. Some people just of our background, background and upbringing are a little ashamed to admit what they're into and they don't want to share it with their partner. You said you came from a very like religious and conservative family. Oh yeah, Pentecostal Christian. Did you have shame involving this when you first got into it? Hmm, that's a very good question. Um, I was always into it. I left my mother in that home when I was 18 mm. and then I never looked back. So I think I shed that shame right away and then I was just like a kid in the candy store. I'm like, I'm doing what wow. I want, mm -hmm. that. Are you still close with your family and don't stuff? Don't talk to her, don't talk to wow. her. Since you left? No, it was about 10 years ago when, uh, yeah, she's she's very religious. Think Sarah Palin. She acts, talks, looks like Sarah Palin. Wow. There's just no community. Very Trump supporter, right-wing Republican. It's, there's just no good that can come out of conversations with her. Mm. Did she know that this is the world you're in, too, too? I don't know. <gasps> and I don't care. I love it. I think... I Yo, he said, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> Woo! Okay, listen to me when I say this, because I know that I'm infamously known for having a good relationship with my Trump voting anti-gay parents. Um... What I What is good for me does not mean it's good for you. What's good for Mr. Christopher doesn't mean it's good for you or me. I love that he knows himself well enough to know nothing good will come out of a conversation with her. This is such key language. Nothing good will come out of a conversation with my mother. Versus, for me, it's mostly good. I have 90% of the time a great relationship with my parents. 
maybe even 95, right? So for me, obviously it's worth it. But for him, it sounds like he's having 95% of a bad time with his mother. Not worth it, girl. Bye. Bye. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to make it clear from my perspective, if you're having that kind of a relationship with a parent where nothing good ever comes out of it, girl, bye. Bye. You know? I I think that sometimes there are boundaries that need to be had. You know what I mean? No, especially if they're unsafe and unhealthy for you. For sure. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people on my channel that have come to that terms with their family and realize that, you know, as much as it's their family or whatever, it's like it's not healthy for them to have them in their lives anymore because they're not accepting of who they are. No, and that's why a lot of queer youth and a lot of uh, queer have chosen families. Uh, we True, true. And this is why I, I really believe in chosen family, but let me tell you something. This reality is also why conservative parents eventually understand their kids better because they have to, they do learn eventually. I think my parents even realize like if we don't talk to our children and we don't have a relationship with them, not talking to them is not going to help us because we're stubborn. To, we're all Arab. We are just as stubborn as you. You don't talk to us. We don't talk to you. You're the one who ended the conversation. No, no, no. In my household, whoever stops talking to whoever, that's who needs to re, re up the conversation. So if mom and dad stop talking to you because you're gay, oh, guess who's the one who's going to have to make the move to reopen this conversation? It's not the person that didn't stop the talking. And I think this is like very consent based. Ultimately, I do this with my friends, with my family. If you need to stop talking to me for some reason, I I support this. But you got to be the one to reach out, girl, because you're the one who stopped the communication. And so my parents raised me this way. This is how we've always done it. And that's why my parents make an effort to talk to their kids because they got three gay kids. And if they don't make the effort, if they want to stop, if, like, you know, this game parents play where they're like, I'm going to disown you. And then you're going to have to chase after me. Mm mm. We don't chase girl. We only chase booty. We don't chase parents. No, ma'am. You raised us too independent and resilient. That's the thing. My parents raised us too independent to chase them. So if you would like a relationship, you better start talking to us again. This whole, I'm going to disown my kids if they're gay. Bye. Bye. That's it, girl. That's it. Like, and I know some parents play that game because some friends play that game. Some people play that game. Like, I'm not going to talk to him and he's just going to message. Oh, girl. Mm -mm. I ain't chasing nobody. I'm not chasing you. I'm not chasing my mom. I'm only chasing booty after all. Make and create our only own families that accept us for who we are. Do you talk about prices with your score business? Oh, yeah. Uh, always up front. Are you, no, you're public about that. Oh, I, I don't put it in my ad, but when they contact me, I'll tell them the price. Okay, got it. I was yeah. curious if you want to talk about that on this, but okay, perfect. No, I mean, I don't care. Oh, you want to know how much? <laughs> I'm, I'm nosy. I'm I want to know how much. Spill the tea. <laughs> like to know. Do you mind? $300 an hour. Nice. Okay, that, that's good. Yeah, no, I, I hope so. How do, you, how do you figure that price out? That's good. I mean, even with his YouTube following, I feel like he could amp it up to $500, $600 an hour. I mean... You know, inflation. Time. It, it, it's really negotiating what I have t actual time for. I'm kind of a busy guy with everything else we got going. Um, and I'm choosy about clients. I, I don't have to do this. At this point, I do it almost, and it sounds weird, like a community service. Hmm. As a, I, I turn down a lot of people. Really? Yeah. I don't have time. Do you have a lot of people coming to you that know of you from youtube and stuff and like oh i want to experience that it's almost like they're like experience it with you know it's like a celebrity in their eyes you know what i mean sometimes yes and is that kind of hot for you or how do you feel mm. good point jj says um with how professional he could go higher i wonder if he's doing it because the title of this is i do this as a community service because if you look at your escorting your sw work as your sw work work that's funny s work as sort of a a, a um uh, a service to the community, then you would also give it to them within budget. I think everyone, you know, I think that's reasonable. I think that's a, yeah. I think if he's not just focused on the money and he's focused on the community aspect, you would keep it within range. Even though he could, like if he got to like 4 million subscribers, he could definitely up that price. But maybe he's just keeping it reasonable because 300 is a lot, but it's also like, it wouldn't be outrageous for him to offer, to charge more. But you know what I mean? Maybe it's a, 
we're doing this for the community. You know? Mm, I don't think of it as hot or different. It's just, it's kind of like marketing in a way. Uh, at least they found me through that channel. That's what I was going to say earlier about when you're talking about porn, why people would do porn still nowadays. It, it, it cross promotes, they do a studio porn, and then all of a sudden people are watching that and they want, <gasps> yeah. so they subscribe to fans. Studios are very good about promoting a name and their imagery mm. is actually really good too. Mm. So, and they still have those algorithms out there that people still gravitate to. And so I still do studio and I do one or two a year and that keeps my name in those channels. You are a vast of knowledge about this whole world. Like, I think I could talk to you about an, an hours about just your life in general and also the BDSM world and your upbringing. It's all just so fascinating. So really, thank you so much for opening up. No, oh, thank you. This has been kind of fun. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Awesome. I want to tie you up now. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Sir? <laughs> yeah. I love Sir. it. I might not leave. Okay, I'm turning this off. <laughs> Sir. I absolutely love spending time with Daddy. He is so wise and educational, and it just makes such perfect sense why him and Amps job is essentially educating so many of us in the BDSM world in general. The follow-up episode will center on Amp's story as well as oh. a sit down with the both of them when we really dive deeper into the relationship. Okay, I love this. I'm gonna like it, of course. I'm actually gonna subscribe. Matt Cullen is his name. I'll go ahead and link it as well in the chat. But more than that, um, he's got part two up. Should we watch it? I feel like we should watch it. I'm gonna like it already. I just know it's gonna be good. In my head Then 